the buckling of columns. Because it's a column, that means there's only one member. That means the condition is very simple. For this particular member, you may call it member one, for instance, because we don't have one member. You call it number one. And the way for your analysis or for the way for you to decide that whether your job is done here is simply by looking at this particular member. So you can say for member one, when P, the loading P is greater than PCR, which you know how to calculate this, is simply supported big uh, column that is pi squared, not just pi, times EI over L squared. If that's the case, then what do we say? We predict that buckling will occur. And we predict that, of course, depending on also the slenderness ratio. If you have P greater than PCR, we predict that buckling can occur. Now, the next level of checking is what? Is when P is greater than PCR and you want to know that whether it's elastic buckling or plastic buckling. So how do we check that? We introduce different kind of parameters. You can use the slenderness ratio divided by radius of gyration, which is uh, the slenderness ratio is L over R. Right? When L over R, is greater than some number in AIC, AIC it could be 150, then you know that this is a long column. If it's less than 40, you said it's a short column. If it's long columns, we know this would definitely be elastic buckling. If it's long columns, we say it's plastic buckling or inelastic buckling to, to, to be consistent with the terminology that I've been using in this class. So we have two levels of analysis so far. One is the checking of the critical load. The other is calculate the standard ratio. So we know it's gonna buckle. But here, our analysis is very simple. You had only one member, only one member. You just had to perform this check for only one member. It applies also to bin column. So for columns and bin columns, it's all the same. But for rigid frames, the situation becomes slightly different. To constitute a structure to be a rigid frame, you need at least two members, right? If you don't have two members, you either have a column or you have a beam, or you have a beam column. To make it a rigid frame, you need to have at least two. And that means this is the the simplest rigid frame that you can consider with two members. And your loading, of course, can be applied this way. If one end here, the support on the right, if this one is a roller, to make this structure buckle, you can only consider this case. The loading has to be vertical. The horizontal force will not buckle the structure because you have a roller here, right? So how do you make the horizontal force? Suppose you want to consider another horizontal force. It's called P2, if the first one is P1. If you want to allow this rigid frame to sustain the application of P2, you have to change, turn this roller support into a hinge. Otherwise, you will not be able to take any horizontal force. Now, the next level, in this case, in either way, this is the simplest case of rigid frames. You need to consider that which member can buckle. In the case of P1, suppose we have 
one and two, you need to perform the analysis for both. Now, by observation, you know that if you only have a P1 acting on this rigid frame, member two is not under any application of axial force. So you can just pass the analysis on member two. But what if you actually have a combined loading that includes both the vertical and horizontal forces? In that case, you actually have to perform the buckling analysis for every single member in a rigid frame, right? So what is the fundamental difference between here? In terms of the amount of work, the buckling analysis for rigid frames takes a little bit more time because you need to go through every single members, whichever is under the application of an axial force. Now, another issue with rigid frame is that unlike columns and beam columns, rigid, many of the rigid frames actually, because they have more redundancies, what is the idea of redundancies? Uh, can anyone tell me what's the, uh, what's the meaning of structural redundancies that you learn from structural analysis? An element fails, the load path goes to a different element. Mm -hmm. And can you use a parameter to quantify structural redundancies? I give you a hint, indeterminate structures. Degrees of, yeah. Degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom is related to degrees of redundancies. Suppose you have a simply supported structure and suppose you have a simply supported beam. What is the degree of freedom of this? Well, if you calculate the number of reactions, you know that how many, how many reactions that the simply supported structure can accommodate? How many? Three. Three, right? There are three of them. Why there are three of them? One, two, three, of course. Assuming an arbitrary direction for these reactions. They don't have to be up or they can be any direction. But just to show you the idea, there are three of them. If you have any more than three reactions that will make this structure from the determ statically determinate structure into what we call statically indeterminate structure, Right? How do we do that? Very simple. What if I turn this structure here? What if I turn the hinge into a, how would you propose? A fixed ended. Right? If we do that, this is no longer a statically determined structure. This becomes a statically indeterminate structure and the degrees of indeterminacy is one, because how many reactions we have? You're gonna have everything the same. But now we have one more, that is the moment. Again, just assuming arbitrary direction. So here, the number of reactions is four. That is one more than three. So the degree of indeterminacy in this kind of structure is one. That happens to rigid frames too. And the reason we use rigid frame is because when one member fails, other members can still carry out the load by what we call low redistribution. And that's why we don't see columns, we don't see beams that many of them in our everyday application, we actually see rigid frames everywhere because they are safer. And their structural safety will not depend on just one or two members. It actually depends on the failure of multiple members. That makes the analysis on the buckling for rigid frames a little bit tricky. So that's one thing that you need to know. Now, 
Another thing about the buckling behavior of rigid frames is the nonlinear amplification effects due to change of geometry. What does that mean? Starting from the definition, and I know that we talk about this definition from the very, begin from the very beginning. We said, if you consider a simply supported column, subjected the force P like this, and the deformation profile is going to be something like this. Buckling is nothing but a structure finding a kinematically admissible deformation profile with reduced loading level. That's what buckling means. In this case, we define the perpendicular deflection as capital delta. So whenever we calculate delta, is this delta. And that's perpendicular to the direction of axial force. There's another delta actually in the analysis of rigid frames. In this case, suppose you apply the force on this three member rigid frame here. The deformation profile may be something like this, just for instance could probably deform like this, right? That's one possible mode. Now in this case, we actually have two different kinds of deltas we can define. One of the delta is the, 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 the deflection perpendicular to the axial force P, which is this one. So from here to here, this is the capital delta. But there's also another delta that is in the same direction of the axial force application, which is this one here. We call this one the regular delta. So there are two different kind of P delta effects. Now, the P delta effect, which is the one we decide that whether the critical low is going to happen or not, is by observing the change of this capital delta. How do we know that? Because P critical load occurs. You remember this when what? When we say that the, the capital delta approaches to what? Approaches to what? Infinity. Good. Infinity, right? So that means you need to know which direction you're looking at. Otherwise, you cannot determine what is critical load. So this capital delta has something to do with the critical law. And the other delta here has nothing to do with critical law. But because of the application of this P, because of buckling, this delta, regular delta, can be amplified because of the application of critical law. So the first capital delta is the quiet condition you use to determine critical law. But the other delta, you don't use it for finding critical law. You use it for finding maximum deflection and maximum moment. Basically, you can think about this way. Capital delta is perpendicular to your force P for any member under consideration. And the regular delta is what? In parallel to your force P. So use this to help you to remember and distinguish these two. Uh, I'm sorry, this should be regular delta. Uh, 